Hello everyone, this is Nystagmus back with another episode of Better Know a Leader. Uh, as you remember last time, I covered Sir Wilfrid Laurier from Canada, and I am absolutely ecstatic and happy that everyone enjoyed the content and am happy to continue making these videos. As always, for this video as well, I will be leaving references below in the description and also places to go to read for more detail. This week, I will be profiling Kupe of the Maori, who was a legendary figure in the mythology and oral history of some Maori tribes. As I go forward, I will endeavor to do my best to pronounce the names and places of the Maori as bet to the best of my ability, and I apologize in advance for any mispronunciations that may occur. Various legends and histories describe Kupe as being involved with the Polynesian discovery of New Zealand around 1300 CE. However, the details differ from tribe to tribe. Most of the stories are of Kupe discovering New Zealand during a voyage from other Polynesian islands. This is likely the reason why when you play Kupe in the game Civilization VI, you do not start out on land, but rather in the sea ready to discover where you will eventually found your civilization. There are several different stories and histories of Kupe depending on the source of the information. The so-called quote orthodox end quote version relies on the account of the New Zealand ethnologist Percy Smith. In the orthodox version, Kupe was a great chief of Hawaki who arrived in New Zealand in 925 CE. He left his cousin Harupa to drown during the fishing expedition and kidnapped his wife, with whom he fled with her great canoe. During their subsequent journeys, they overcame numerous monsters and sea demons, including the great octopus named Tiwiki Aromoragi, and discovered New Zealand. Returning to Hawaki, Kube told of his adventures and convinced others to migrate with him. Over time, however, the veracity of Percy Smith's account had been called into question. David Simmons, another famous New Zealand ethnologist, said, quote, A search for the sources of what I now call the great New Zealand myth of Kupe, Toy, and the fleet had surprising results. In this form, they did not exist in the old manuscripts nor in the Wakero of learned men. Bits and pieces there were. Kupe was and is known, and the traditions of the Hokikanda, Wakato, East Coast, and South Island, but the genealogies given did not tally with those given by Percy Smith. The stories given by Smith were a mixture of differing tribal tradition. In other words, the whole tradition as given by Smith was Pakia, not Maori. Similarly, the story of Toy and the Watonga and the canoe race leading to the settlement in New Zealand could not be authenticated except from the one man who gave it to Percy Smith. Learned men of the same tribe make no mention of this story, and there are no uh, wa uh, Wakata for celebrating their deeds. Tribal origin canoes are well known to the tribes belonging to them, but none of them talk, as Smith did, of six large sea-going canoes settling out together from Reatia. The New Zealand myth was just that. Simmons, 1977. The amount of information on Kupe is fragmentary, and the story changes slightly depending on which tribe of the Maori that you're talking to. In the description below, I will give examples of different stories of Kupe depending on the tribe in which the story comes from. I'll also take this opportunity to talk about the Maori people as a civilization in this segment. Polynesian culture recently got the Disney treatment in the 2016 movie Moana. Moana draws on several aspects of different Polynesian cultures, including the Maori. It also showcased how the Maori, and by extension, other Polynesian peoples were voyagers that used the constellations and currents to settle on several islands in the Pacific Ocean. The most specific reference to the Maori culture was the protagonist Maui, who is a mythological demigod. As in the movie, he is a ship-shifting trickster who accomplishes great feats for the benefit of humanity. The movie even includes his origin story of being cast into the sea, although in the myth he actually does have parents and he goes on a quest later to find them. The Maori are the indigenous Polynesian people of the mainland of New Zealand. The Maori originated from settlers from Eastern Polynesia who arrived in New Zealand in several waves of canoe voyages between roughly 1320 and 1350 CE. Over several centuries in isolation, these settlers developed their own distinctive culture, whose language, mythology, crafts, and performing arts evolved independently from those other Eastern Polynesian cultures. The arrival of Europeans in New Zealand starting in the 17th century brought enormous changes to the Maori way of life. The Maori people gradually adopted many aspects of Western society and culture. Initial relations between the Maori and the Europeans were largely amicable, with the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi in 1840, the two cultures coexisted. The text of the treaty includes a preamble and three articles. It is bilingual, 
with the Maori text inaccurately translated from the English, which led to several disagreements and misconceptions. Article 1 of the Maori text grants governance rights to the crown, while the English text cedes, quote, all rights and powers of sovereignty to the crown, end quote. Article 2 of the Maori text establishes that the Maori will retain full chieftainship over their lands, villages, and all their treasures, while the English text establishes and continued ownership of the Maori over their lands and establishes the exclusive right of pre exemption of the crown. Article 3 gives Maori people full rights and protections as British subjects. However, because of the misconceptions due to the mistranslations, disagreements within the treaty led to the New Zealand War soon after its signing. At the peak of hostilities in the New Zealand Wars in the 1860s, 18,000 British troops supported by artillery, cavalry, and local militia battled about 4,000 Maori warriors in what became a gross imbalance of manpower and weaponry. Although outnumbered, the Maori were able to withstand their enemy and to with techniques that included anti-artillery bunkers and the use of carefully placed fortified villages that allowed them to block their enemy's advance and often inflict heavy losses, yet quickly abandon their positions without significant loss to themselves. Those hostilities and the Maori early success against all odds likely solidified the perception of the Maori Toa warrior. Toa warriors performed the haka, an energetic chant before battle. It is now performed before sporting events, formal greetings, and even weddings. The Maori fight for their rights culminated in the protest movement in the 1960s and 1970s. While this movement has ex existed since Europeans first colonized New Zealand, its modern form emerged in the early 1970s and has focused on issues such as the Treaty of Watangi, the Maori land rights, Maori language and culture, and racism. In the 2018 census, there were 775,836 people in New Zealand identifying as Maori, making up 16.5% of the national population. They are the second largest ethnic group in New Zealand after European New Zealanders. In addition, more than 140,000 Maori live in Australia. The Maori language is spoken to some extent by a fifth of all Maori, representing 3% of the total population. The Maori are active in all spheres of New Zealand culture and society, with independent representation in areas such as the media, politics, and sports. Well, this concludes this episode of Better Know a Leader. As always, history is a complicated subject, and if you'd like to know more, check the description for more details. Please let me know who you'd like me to do next for the next episode in the comments below or join our Discord. And as always, always follow The Civ Show on our YouTube channel, and follow us on Twitch for our Sunday games playing Civilization VI. Until next time.